of enemies last year, which was shortlisted for an Oscar. Of course, 20 Feet from Stardom, which did win the Academy Award, played that about 100 times. Um, and But you've done a lot of documentaries with musicians from Burt Bacharach, Johnny Cash, Pearl Jam. I mean, you're going through a lot of genre there. Um, but about this film, why don't we start off like just talking a little bit about how you got connected to Yo-Yo Ma. I know you have a really wonderful little story about that. You know, I, I am a musician, and a um, very amateur musician, <laughs> but a musician. And, um, but even more than that, I've kind of been, a, I guess, a music geek my whole life. And it's something that I just have always been obsessed with. And somehow early on, I said, well, why don't I make documentaries about music? It'll give me an excuse to indulge in my music, my music habits. It's an excuse to collect records and listen to music all the time and read about it. Um, and it's kind of led me on this incredible journey I've had through my career with different people, especially now You know, when I start working with people like Yo-Yo, um, which is a part of the music world that I knew very little about. I mean, the classical. I, I mean, I, and I, the classical world, but even I knew some of Yo-Yo's classical work, but even this part of Yo-Yo's work is even the more, um, you know, the more obscure, I guess. Um, but I'd gotten a call, actually, um, because I'd done a project with James Taylor years ago, and Yo-Yo and James both have houses in the Berkshires, That's right. and they have the same manager, and the manager said, well, if you're going to make a documentary, you've got to talk to Morgan Neville. So I flew out to Cambridge to meet Yo-Yo, this is five years ago. And uh, it was a rainy night, and uh, it was the end of the day in his office. They had set up some wine and cheese in the corner of the room, and there was a table full of people, and we sat down. And I don't know if Yo-Yo sensed that I was nervous or, or what, but after maybe 10 minutes, he said, Morgan, can you come with me? I have a really serious question I need to ask you. And I was kind of taken aback and a little flustered, and I said, sure, sure. And I walked with him over to the corner of the room, and we stood there by this table with wine and cheese, and he said, I have a really serious problem, and I need your help. I don't know whether or not to recommend the Merlot or the Pinot Noir, because they're, both, because they're both so fucking good. That's actually what he said to me. And I said, OK, well, this is not what I expected from the Yo-Yo. Um, come to realize, disarming. Disarming. totally disarming, which Yo-Yo is so good at doing. Um, an hour later, we were talking about philosophy. An hour after that, he was looking at pictures of my kids. Uh, you know, he walked me out in the rain and stood there in the rain for three minutes <laughs> while the cat showed up. Um, and we kind of hatched this plan that night. You know, you have that kind of documentarian instinct of, you know, I'll follow this guy with the camera anywhere. You know, because, you know, I've known of Yo-Yo and heard his music my whole life, but I didn't really have a sense of what made him tick. But the thing he talked about that night that really resonated with me is when he talks about the story that there's a version of in the film that he had this kind of midlife crisis in his 30s where he had to decide, you know, do I even want to do music? I never actually chose to do music. I was good at it, but do I want to do it? And the realization he came to is, yes, I want to do music if it can be about more than just music. If I can see what I can do with music, both to understand the world and to maybe change the world. And for somebody that does culture documentaries and for somebody that makes film, these are questions I grapple with all the time. And it was kind of those questions were the things that kicked off this whole film, you know, and kind of asking these big questions of does culture matter and in which way? And, um, and so, you know, I had no idea that night that I was going to be shooting in refugee camps in Jordan or kind of be traveling around the world. I mean, it was kind of an incredible kind of, uh, you know, opening of the onion, the making of this film over many years. This took uh, obviously a number of years. To find the time uh, to try and yeah. wow, wow. But also, I was making these other films. <laughs> I'm always making a lot of films. That's how you work as an independent filmmaker. You always have, um, you know, maybe three or four films you're working on because they can take five years, like it did in this case. Or Best of Enemies took seven. In terms of funding, I mean, I saw that HBO was involved. It was was that a big part of? of why it took so long? Did you have to go out and get funding, or was yeah? That's always why. Right. Okay. <laughs> that's that's always. Okay. Um, yeah, and HBO they acquired it at the end, so that we didn't have funding from them. Um, yeah, we did get some some grant money from uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities. Gave us a big grant. 
which was the most difficult grant you could ever apply for. <laughs> but I just figured if, with a project like this, with Yo-Yo coming off of 20 feet, if I can't get this grant, then I'm never going to apply for the grant. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and, and we did, and it was great. We've had a great experience. Participant media came in early on and helped us finish it. Uh, and then it just kind of snowballed from there. And uh, yeah, and it's it's kind of ongoing. Yo-Yo's actually, the whole Silk Road Ensemble's just starting the tour next week. Oh, um, so Boston dates, I, I think? I know they're playing Tanglewood. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm trying to remember where else on the East Coast. And I know they're ending at the Hollywood Bowl where I'm going to see them in a few weeks. Great, so. fantastic. They're out there. So yes, oh, you already you knew I was going to ask audience questions. Please. Um, how difficult was it to get access to some of the places that you visited? Mm -hmm. uh, how difficult was it to get access? Yeah, to some of the places we visited. Um, it was actually relatively difficult. Uh, particularly, shooting the refugee camp was really tough. Um, and not even so much from the Jordanian government, but just the, you know, we, we went in through um, Save the Children, which was one of the biggest NGOs that operates. We were in the Zadari camp, which is just two kilometers from the Syrian border. And um, they do not only, the, uh, not only the education programs there, but they do the food programs. Um, but there is kind of a turf war between all the NGOs and the kind of self-policing refugee force. They have their own kind of security force, and there's the state military, and everybody wants, you know, if you go in one person, then everybody else is kind of hostile to you. But we actually ended up, um, I don't know, being detained, but we definitely spent a few hours in, in the... Um, the police headquarters there, where they were watching uh, dubbed reruns of Magnum P.I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we sat there, it was very surreal. Wow, wow, that's amazing. This, uh, there's a lot mentioned about doing your interviews with you, and you Yeah, did, did Yo-Yo bring up his work? Um, yeah, did Yo-Yo bring up his work? He did with Brazil, like Astro Piazzolla and, and Rosa Passos. Um, he, we, we talked about it all. I mean, I think because he's had a number. You know, I, I think the um, this kind of crisis he had in his thirties, this kind of saying, "Well, what else can I do with it?" led him to. I think his first. I mean, the Bobby McFerrin album he did was kind of one of his first experiments outside of the genre. He did the Astro Piazzolla album, he did an Ennio Marconi, he did the whole Goat Rodeo project, this kind of bluegrass project with Mark O'Connor and a bunch of other great people. Um, so he's, you know, it's all part of the whole picture of what he's been doing. You know, this, the Silk Road, why it's lasted, I think, for him, and he revisits all these other collaborations, but it's kind of, he's been able to make it the umbrella that actually encompasses all these other ideas. So now, like, he actually has an organization, and they, they're based out of Harvard right now, uh, and they're doing these programs on, you know, cultural entrepreneurship, which is teaching business skills to artists, um, doing all kinds of education programs, tons of education programs. Um, and it's kind of become a way to put an umbrella um, around, you know, over all these things. And that's why I think, actually, Silk Road, I mean, it started literally talking about Silk Road music, but Silk Road is just a metaphor for this trading of culture that goes back, you know, that everything from pasta to algebra to Islam traveled the Silk Road and was shared from one end of the continent to the other. And this idea that we all share these cultures. And getting into it with him, I mean, you, musicologically, you can get deep into it. And, and I did, and I find that fascinating. I didn't put that much of it into the movie because, in a way, it becomes like a, more like a book than a film. You can get very intellectual, but you know if you start looking at the connections between a, a pipa and a guitar or a, a, a Comanche, like a the Cajon's instrument, the Persian spike fiddle, Comanche, it's kind of seen as the most the purest Persian instrument. Uh, this this spike fiddle, it has four strings. It has four strings. Used used to have two strings for a thousand years. Until they saw a violin 500 years ago wow. and said, "Well, if they have four strings, we should have four strings." <laughs> um, and there's so many examples of like that, but things that seem so pure, uh, in fact, have always been in dialogue with other cultures. 
going back, you know, millennia. Yeah. Well, that's the amazing thing. Music is ancient. It goes back to the beginning of time, really. Mm -hmm. Humans. Okay, right here, Marsha. Um, what kind of a crew, how large a crew did you have, and what was your concept for the visualization? Because I noticed it was a floating camera a lot, and everything seemed to move and merge into the next scene. Well, the visualization, the idea, of, it was this idea of movement. And, um, you know, how big was our crew? I mean, we brought a steady cam around to a lot of these locations, which is crazy um, <laughs> to rural China. Um, and part of that was we had a friend who was a Chinese steady cam operator who was only to, who was already there shooting a Chinese movie. Um, so we did a couple shoots like that, and we, and even though we had a that kind of a shooting like that, we still had a skeleton crew. I think there were five of us, um, and yeah, so it was still pretty pretty lean. Um, but it was this idea that we're always in movement and, and motion, and that you know you're not necessarily sure where you are. You're going from one country to the other, and, and then even in editing, we came up with this kind of. You call it like the spin the globe montages, these kind of where are we going to land? You know, we're kind of getting these glimpses of different places and then we're landing in a different country. Cindy. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, Cindy. Um, that was a really wonderful film. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, Yo Yo's son was such a powerful voice in this film. And I was curious, whose idea was it to have him? And could you tell us a little more about him and yeah. what he does? So Yo Yo's son, uh, Nicholas. Uh, he, he like everybody in their family, all went to Harvard and uh, is brilliant and speaks five languages and was a consultant at McKinsey. Then he went to work for John Kerry, um, doing some of his foreign policy in the Senate. Uh, so he's a sharp guy and the, the dumbest thing I think he's done is he just quit all of that two years ago to get to NYU film school to become a documentary filmmaker. You <laughs> 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 and your inspiration. Yeah. You were the inspiration. Um, and I guess I can say it, uh, that he, he, he's actually worked with me on a, one of my next films, which is uh, a Mr. Rogers film. Oh. Yeah, so. And he was on that. Mr. Rogers sure. playing piano when he was 10. So. Oh, wow. But they wow. became lifelong friends to Fred and, and Yo Yo and Nicholas. Okay. So, why don't we take this? And then we'll go. I wanted uh, to know the dancing, the dance was uh, just fantastic. The dancer. The dancer is this incredible Memphis dancer named Lil Buck. L I L apostrophe Buck. Um, it's called juke dancing. It's a kind of hip hop street dancing that comes from Memphis. He lives in Los Angeles now, and he's kind of popped up in Super Bowl commercials and with Madonna or doing with you know. Um, he's done a lot of work with the American Ballet Theater too. You know, he's kind of he straddles all of these worlds. Um, but yeah, he's absolutely amazing. And Yo Yo's taking him around a lot of times if he has to go. You know, I know he took him to China because he was on a kind of cultural diplomacy tour, giving talks and playing, and he brought Will Buck with him. So he does things like that. This gentleman. Yeah, the cinematography and the music are just perfect. Uh, and the editing is just great, too. How many hours of film did you have? They always ask the hours. Right? In. It's always so hard. Now you tend to, tend to measure film in gigabytes, <laughs> or terabytes even. Um, you know, hundreds of hours, you know, I don't know exactly, but, you know, maybe 500 hours, you know. For 90 minutes. For 90 minutes, yeah. That's difficult. Uh, yes, it's still right here. Can you talk a little bit about the composition? Did they start with traditional songs and then improvise? Or tell us a little bit about that. So the way compositions um, find their way into the ensemble, there are two or three or four different ways. Um, they commission pieces from composers, um, which used to be a lot more difficult because nobody knew <laughs> what these instruments were or exactly how it would work. But when they started that first Tanglewood workshop, they actually started with, I think, 16 commissioned pieces. Um, now there are a number of composers, several in the film, who've, over the years, 
done a number of different commission pieces. And part of what, you know, now that they, you know, they raise money to pay composers to actually do this, uh, members of the ensemble also bring pieces in uh, or do arrangements of traditional pieces. So, you know, Christina's done that, uh, Wu Tong's done that, Wu Man. Um, one of my favorite pieces is the piece that uh, Wu Tong, who's the Chinese Sheng player, uh, there's a scene of him and Yo-Yo teaching a little class, and he sings a song and Yo-Yo's playing cello. And that piece is, you know, Yo-Yo's playing Bach, and Wu Tong is singing this very traditional Taiwanese song, kind of as a mashup on top of each other, and they kind of fit perfectly. Um, so there's a lot of kind of a lot generated by them themselves, and uh, yeah, they just they I mean they have a new album they just put out a couple months ago that actually is um, it's not the soundtrack of the film we're doing a separate. I was going to ask you about that. Is the soundtrack going to be available? It's, well, we're doing it on iTunes because bits and pieces of these songs are on different albums or been performed live, and um, but this new album is uh, duets. And um, it's some traditional songs, traditional American songs, songbook songs, uh, foreign songs. One of my favorite things on the album is that uh, Lisa Fisher was one of the singers from 20 Feet from Stardom, mm -hmm. yes. who, oh, who is yeah. certainly the, like, the sweetest, greatest lady I've, I've ever met. Um, and when I got to know Yo-Yo, I just kept saying, that you're the nicest guy I've ever met. <laughs> She's the nicest lady. Like, you guys are so on the same wavelength you have to get together. And I said this for probably three years, and finally they took me up on it. So Lisa cool. does a duet cool. with them on this, this album. Be on iTunes. Yeah, or it's on iTunes. This, this is on iTunes right now. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, let's see. They're called the, uh, the, the amazing Chinese the original rock and roll guys. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're called the Zhang family band, and they're from this village outside of Xi'an, China. And you know, Wu Man, when she had started going back to China and documenting this disappearing Chinese folk music, when I saw them, I just said, I have to go meet them. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it's not the easiest place to get to, um, but they were just, you know, incredible performers and. You know, but what she says in the film is very true, and and has even in the time she's known them, which has maybe been eight years, um, even become kind of sadly more true that that what they're doing and have been doing for nine, ten generations really is. You know, a couple of them have died, and and there's no next generation coming along to support them. So I know one of their sons um, just left the village um, to go work uh, outside of this type of a career. Um, you know, it's one of those um, those things about China. China's so fixated on the new and the modern these days that um, you know, of all places, it it has a blind eye to its own its own past. Old culture. And I mean, this is something we kind of saw over and over. And it's this. You know, we talked a lot about this idea of, again culture, but cultural revolutions. And if you look at the cultural revolutions, this kind of I never pieced this all together until I was working on the film. But talking about cultural revolutions in China or Russia or Syria or Iran, certainly, or even Spain, you could call it under Franco. When you have cultural revolutions, um, they're, they're not called cultural revolutions by accident. You know, the, that's the easiest way to subjugate somebody is to, to erase their culture because that's how they identify themselves. And in all those cultural revolutions, it wasn't just stamping out Western influence in those cultures. True. It was stamping out traditional influence. And that happened in Iran. That's what happened to all the traditional schools in China as well. Um, so you know, you really, you're. I'm often kind of amazed at how little. I mean, in America, you kind of expect us to not care about our history, but you, you would think in these other cultures, um, so rooted in you know in ancient history, that they would have more regard for it. But they don't seem to. Yes. Of 
know, he did bring his family on the road. I mean, they, once they were in school, they couldn't travel much. But I think, he, oh yeah, they're a very tight family. Um, there's a sister, Nicholas's sister, and um, and Jill, their mom. You know, they're you know they spent. <clears throat> you know, the yo-yo takes off. I mean, now he, he tours less than he used to. I think he used to do something like 250 days a year. Now I think he's down to only like 120 or something. Um, but they're very tight, and I don't. I really don't think there's a lot of resentment about that because I think when Yo-Yo was home, he was really home, and whenever he could bring them, he brought them. I mean, his kids have traveled everywhere, um, and he's always tried to include them. And um, yeah, Nicholas you know, has told me you know, endless stories about about their adventures on the road, but but it's not easy. I mean, that's part of the sacrifice he had to make and uh, that he talks about, but but that's why he was searching so much for a greater purpose for what he was doing. You know, he could have been really successful just playing the same repertoire, the New York Philharmonic or the Boston Philharmonic for the rest of his life. I have a quick question and we'll, we'll get to your question, but you've done so many amazing documentaries about amazing musicians, top of the game musicians. Have you found like any one or two threads that are very similar to all those individuals? Something that sort of you've kind of recognized in all of them? Well, I mean, there's a generosity, I think, to mm-hmm. all of them. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a lack of calculation to all of them. I mean, I think, um, and I've seen this because I've made art films too, um, that, you know, most every great artist or musician I've met never got into it to be a famous artist or musician. Um, and in fact, uh, in previous generations, that wasn't even a rational thought. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, there was no commerce. Yeah, I mean, I think about it I, I, with art, but I think about it with music schools now, too. Um, you know, now we have art schools and music schools pumping out, or film schools, for that matter, pumping out thousands thousands of grads every year who all think they're going to be, you know, Keith Richards or Martin Scorsese or whomever. And the reality is um, very few are ever going to make a living at it. Um, but when people like Keith Richards <laughs> went to art school, or um, you know Ed Ruscha, who I made a film with, um, you know was hoped he could get a job laying out magazines. That was about his biggest ambition as an artist. You know there was no kind of expectation that this or James Taylor, same thing. You know that he thought he just played folk clubs, and that was you know there was no idea that he would actually be successful at it. Um, and I have to say, as a documentary filmmaker, um, if you go into it thinking you're going to be rich and famous, then you've lost something. You know, you're, <laughs> right, uh, right. you have to go go pick something a lot easier than this, right. um, because you've got to do it because you love it. And I think that, in a way, is the thing that connects all yes, of it. Yes. That it's that um, the passion of the work itself, regardless of how it's um, received or how it sells or accepted, that you just got to please yourself with it. <coughs> Yes, we, we, the gentleman first and then behind. Yes. Yes. Me? Yep, yep, you. So how does the Silk Ensemble uh, get together and, and work? Do they get together for a month or so, a year, and then and then do all their things and then go off and do their separate things? Or, you know, and yeah, how about Oyo Ma? Does he spend a month with them and then do all the other stuff later? Or? Yeah, it's a little flexible, but I'd say generally um, they do a couple of one-week workshops a year where they just get together and workshop new pieces and do education and stuff. Um, Then they do maybe two or three tours a year for maybe three weeks, and they maybe do a week of rehearsals leading up to that. So, you know, all told, it's maybe three months out of the year for each of them, and they have their own careers. Some people are you know, literally orchestras or schools, you know, all over the world. So just the the effort to get them together is very expensive and, and difficult to schedule. I'm interested in the artists and how, um, how we can work with the artists to get the, not just the picture that's in the story, but the background. 
so the artist in the film, Kavor Kamurad, who's a, um, you know, um, Syrian from Aleppo, um, but he's a uh, Christian. And he and Kinan have been doing these pieces together for years. And when I first saw him do it, it blew me away. And they've actually done these with, on stage with Yo-Yo and with the ensemble. Uh, and it's kind of been something they've been doing more and more of. Um, so we, you know, and he's such a character and he was so amazing. And then, I mean, when we started the film, Syria, I mean, when we started the film, Kinam was not even in the ensemble and Syria had not yet started its civil war. So, you know, this all unfolded as we were making the film. Um, and even since we finished the film, seeing the refugee crisis kind of reach its, its peak over the past, you know, nine months, uh, and seeing the context of the film changing how the film changes, you know, the idea of, you know, starting to make a film about tradition and home, um, which really then becomes about refugees and what does a homeland mean and all these other questions. I mean, it's interesting as a filmmaker or an artist to see how the context around your work changes and changes how you think about it and how other people think about it. Um, but Kavork then kind of emerged. I mean, he's a great character in the work they were doing. Then Assyria became bigger and Kinan um, became a bigger character. Um, it just became a way of, again, kind of extending the idea that it's not just about music. That music is just one of these languages, but it's all part of the same thing, whether it's literature or art or music or language. You know, that culture, um, you know, shouldn't just be fenced off from other parts of culture. You know, that, that we're all kind of engaged in the same type of dialogue. And I think they've tried to do that as much as possible. Dance, that's why they've tried to bring in dance. And why I want to use a little buck and, you know, there's even more and more of that, but, but that, was, that was important to me. One last question at the very back. Um, what sort of distribution worldwide, especially in the countries that you addressed in the film, would be possible? Because it would seem like <coughs> it would be a revelation to the society to be able, and the government, to be able to see this film. Because it seems like the service of human life is joy, and music is universal. Um, so the distribution, we've actually had a lot of success getting it distributed, and it, that's just starting now, but um, we actually got distribution in China, which for a U.S. documentary is very unusual. Um, Japan and Australia and other countries. The Middle East is virtually, I've never heard of a U.S. documentary getting distribution there. Um, but one thing we have done with the film just in the past two months which I'm really happy about, is we actually dubbed the film into Arabic. And we've been taking it to refugee camps in the Middle East and going back to Zajari and screening the film there. It's been fantastic. fantastic. So Are you working with a particular agency? Yeah, we have back with Save the Children again. And Participant Media was nice enough to pay for us to dub the film into Arabic. And um, so the more we can just get it out there for free in those countries, you know, I'm all for that. So. We'll see. The young lady, we'll take one last one. You've had your hand up, and we'll get that out. <coughs> How did you know when the film was done and you had enough and you had to complete your story? Yeah. How do you know when the film's done? That's, uh, that's an existential question. Um, that um, you kind of are drawing circles around yourself, and they get smaller and smaller until you have nowhere to move. <laughs> that's part of it. <laughs> Um, but, you know, we started, I and mean, the thing is the ensemble were all these amazing musicians. And the thing you don't see is, you know, I spent time with many of them, who, some of whom don't even speak in the film. Um, and so I think it was narrowing down the characters to focus on. And then, and it's not, and this it was very similar with 20 Feet, because I, I interviewed 80 backup singers for 20 Feet. Um, and some of them were incredible, but it's, about finding the balance of characters that represents a certain diversity, but also a similar type of journey, too. And that's the tough part. And once you kind of get there, then you're just massaging the material till you feel you feel it's kind of ready to go. And then they, 
take right out of your hands and <laughs> you have to move on. Well, speaking of moving on, yeah. good thank you very much. Thank you.